the three key issues that we're really going to focus on is that kind of looking at the new players in the 112th Congress, uh, the federal deficit, which is really driving everything that we're talking about in Washington right now, and then how that's going to impact on the 2012 Farm Bill. Some of the new players uh, that you're going to be dealing with that are influencing the process are shown on this screen. The uh, new chairman of the House Agricultural Committee is Frank Lucas. He's from Oklahoma, uh, certainly been involved in a lot of previous farm bills. And he is quick to point out always that uh, you know he, he's from a state that uh, still remembers the Dust Bowl. And when you don't have as much topsoil as we're fortunate to have in Iowa and, and not always the consistent rains, uh, you have a different, aspect, different viewpoint on farm policy. And so he's going to kind of bring that background. He's got a ranching operation um, that his wife runs uh, while he's in Washington. And uh, I guess she's, she's pretty handy around the farm and ranch. He's going to be looking at how you devise a new farm bill that is going to meet the needs not only of the farmers and ranchers in Oklahoma, but looking forward at how you do this on a national basis. Uh, he's partnered with the new ranking minority member, the former chairman of the House Ag Committee, Colin Peterson from Minnesota. And I'm not sure how many people on our line were out in Washington last week. Um, you probably, if you were, you might have met with Mr. Peterson or Mr. Lucas. Uh, they're both very accessible, both very knowledgeable about farm programs. And as most people know, farm policy is usually not a real partisan fight. It's differences are based on geographical lines more than anything. Uh, so uh, Mr. Lucas and Mr. Peterson, I think, are going to do quite a good job uh, uh, trying to get all their committee members. And they've got 16 new freshmen. So uh, just looking at the makeup of the committee now, you're seeing quite a difference. Some of them who have never been through a farm bill before. And Mr. Lucas and Mr. Peterson are going to have to not only educate them, but try to get them up to speed about what some of the different ramifications are on decisions that they might make. At the same time, on the House Ag Committee, you have people like Mr. McGovern from Massachusetts, who has really no rural residents to speak of in his uh, congressional district. And uh, you know, his main areas of interest are the Congressional Hunger Caucus, uh, organic agriculture, and issues like that. So um, they're both going to have their work cut out from them, uh, for them in terms of trying to write this new farm bill and just within their committee structure. On the other side of the Capitol, you've got uh, a new chairwoman, and Debbie Stabenow, for the Senate Ag Committee. Uh, Mrs. Stabenow has been on working on agricultural issues on the House side prior to being elected to the Senate from the state of Michigan. She's very knowledgeable, but uh, again, this is, this is her first rodeo as chairman. And she's got, again, new, some new members and, and a lot of uh, legacy members, like her ranking minority member, Pat Roberts. Uh, Mr. Roberts from Kansas was chairman when the House Agriculture Committee wrote the 95, what became 96 Farm Bill that many have called Freedom to Farm. Uh, critics, of course, have called it Freedom to Fail. Uh, but you've got some real stalwarts like Mr. Roberts uh, there to lend a, a great deal of expertise. And um, so I think that you know, she'll, she'll have her work cut out for her, but at the same time, she's got a lot of experience and background on the committee. But one of the things that will be an influential factor, I think, in how she addresses the Farm Bill is that she has said, we want to be focused on principles and what those major principles are in terms of how do we want to address volatility in agriculture. And uh, of course, Michigan much different than um, Iowa, but does have a lot of corn and soybeans, as well as blueberries and apples and a lot of specialty crops. And her, in the past, her, her expertise has been more in the specialty crop area. She's also been involved in writing some of the legislation that would help farmers uh, participate in whatever kind of cap and trade program was expected to come out of the Senate. That's pretty much dead now. but. Um, so her areas of expertise have been outside of perhaps traditional commodity programs in the past, but I think she's reaching out in order to do so. So that's kind of a quick snapshot on these key players on the House and Senate Ag Committees. But 
the real key players that you're going to have to be watching, at least here in the short term, are in charge of the budget committees. Now, if you've been following any of the things that have been happening over the last few weeks in terms of federal spending, you know that we are still trying to deal with the 2011 spending measures. Uh, during the last year, uh, there should have been an appropriations package that was passed for all the different spending measures, and it never happened. And so it's been what's called a CR, a continuing resolution. And that's been basically keeping the government funded here just a couple of weeks at a time. Uh, the most recent one was uh, passed and will keep the government funding till April 8th. But at some point in time, these um, continuing resolutions will either be uh, you know, kicked down the road again for another couple of weeks or somebody will say, OK, we're going to actually fund all the way through the end of the fiscal year in September. At the same time, what you've got is these budget committee chairmen working on the 2012 uh, budget, which again provides guidance for the authorizing committees on what they should have as available spending. And some folks think that the guidance that may be offered, and of course it may not be approved by both the House and the Senate, but the guidance that may be offered may be so austere in terms of farm spending or that there may be a recommendation that we have budget reconciliation uh, that could be across the board cuts or could just be caps on current spending. I mean, we may be writing part of the Farm Bill as a result of this budget process. And uh, in the next three weeks, you're going to see Paul Ryan, who's a Republican from Wisconsin, roll out what will be not only cuts in discretionary spending, but in mandatory spending. And he's already signaled that his uh, recommendations will provide plenty of fodder for Democrats to attack uh, his committee and himself for going too deep on entitlements. Um, and I think that uh, that's really where you have to watch the parameters of what he's suggesting in terms of whether or not it will involve agriculture. Uh, Senator Kent Conrad, again, is a real deficit hawk. He believes that uh, we do have to make cuts in all of our federal spending, but uh, he's also been a key player in all the previous farm bills. Many people think that the last farm bill on the Senate side, uh, that in addition to Blanche Lincoln as chairwoman, that he and Saxby Chambliss uh, really were the key players behind the scenes. So whatever Mr. Conrad recommends on the budget, I think we'll have a very uh, good perspective from what uh, he sees in the state of North Dakota. And we're, we're going to talk a little bit more about that when I get to this Deficit Reduction Commission. But these are another two key players that you need to keep an eye on. So I mentioned that the budget is driving everything, and, and, and here's why. Um, basically, we've got people from the Congressional Budget Office which do the scoring or the uh, basically telling you what the outlook is and what the trends are on our federal budget. And we've got, uh, in 2011 alone, a $1.5 trillion deficit. You know, those kinds of numbers are clearly unsustainable. And what's going to be done on, on raising the debt ceiling uh, will be a key factor in how some of these things play out. And originally, we thought maybe we'd hit that debt ceiling lim limit in uh, March, but it looks now more like April or May. Uh, we'll have to have a vote. And most of the new GOP uh, freshmen that were elected as a result of this last election cycle have made it very clear that they don't want to raise the debt ceiling unless they get significant reductions. So I think the this heightened awareness to the deficit, which is long overdue in my opinion, uh, is going to, again, be playing out across all the Farm Bill debate. Now, I'm mentioning here that there was a bipartisan deficit commission that issued their recommendations December 1. And again, those recommendations, if you have a chance to Google and actually look through those at some point in time, they're really quite telling in terms of how uh, folks who are looking at the long-term revenue and, and debt situations in our country see farm policy moving forward. Senator Kent Conrad was on this national commission that 
while their recommendations didn't get sent all the way to Congress, uh, they have been embraced by many uh, leaders and are likely to resurface. And what Mr. Conrad did for the risk management part of the Farm Bill was basically to say, we're willing to take cuts. We're willing to take maybe $10 billion in cuts. But he wanted to have part of that money put back into what he sees as a very important part of the safety net, and that's the SURE program, the Supplemental Revenue Insurance Program. Now, he was a key author of that standing disaster program, and it works pretty well in North Dakota. But those of us who are from Iowa know that it, it probably, you know, it hasn't been that popular of a program. And many major farm organizations have already said, you know, we like a lot of things about the current safety net. We like direct payments. We like ACRE. Uh, but sure doesn't seem to get to the top of their list. In fact, the American Farm Bureau Federation at their policy meeting suggested that it, it was not something that they wanted to support. So you've got deficit hawks saying, well, if we got to get rid of some of these other things like direct pay and payments and other pro parts of the farm safety net, that maybe we should put the money into SURE. And again, we'll talk a little bit more about this in a second. But I think that's one of the key factors that I would be thinking about as someone who's uh, active in the political process in Iowa. I'd be thinking about what do I want the safety net to look like in the future, because there's going to be a lot of people weighing in on that specific topic. This is just a chart that shows you what the Congressional uh, Budget Office uh, outlined as part of the big problem. And you can see there's a dark blue line in this chart that shows prior to where we are now that it was only during World War II that we had such a huge percentage, a little over 100, of our gross domestic product uh, as part of the federal debt. But now it looks like we're going to go above that. Again, these are projections out to 2030. So I wouldn't be betting the farm on the fact that they're going to hit the number exactly. But it shows you, I think, very graphically the extent of the problems that we're facing in this country. Um, again, these are Congressional Budget Office charts that look at 2010 spending and how it's broken down and projected federal spending in 2020. A lot of people talk about the fact that we can just cut discretionary spending. These, these chunks that are in the light blue that were 34% and now 24% projected out to 2020 and not have any you know, problems with addressing the federal debt. But when you see these pie charts, you can tell clearly that we have to go into these other areas. There's not enough of the pie in discretionary to really make enough of a difference. This is the farm pie where you have folks that are looking at <clears throat> the portion of the federal budget that is dedicated to agricultural spending. It is less than 1%. It's such a small chart, and it's been going down. The House Agricultural Committee recently sent a letter to Paul Ryan saying that, you know, we've already given $6 billion in cuts out of the crop insurance program last year as part of a renegotiation of the standard reinsurance agreement. But even if you look at the last few years, funding for farm policy, including crop insurance, averaged $12.9 billion per year, which is a 28% reduction from what we were spending 2002 to 2006, where we had an average spending level of $17.9 billion. Prior to that, uh, we were spending about $18.8 billion. So the, small, the, the farm pie that is devoted towards actual production agriculture, those chunks that you see on the right-hand side of this uh, chart for crops and dairy, for crop insurance, for conservation and export and other programs, are relatively small. The biggest percentage goes to child nutrition, the uh, SNAP program, which was formerly called food stamps. And that's about 80% of the budget. So those sorts of programs, as well as production agriculture support programs, will all be on the table. The, both the committees have said every measure of spending will be looked at. But the likelihood of cutting food programs is fairly small compared to cutting the farm portion of the programs. And just 
basically because of the political support attached to that. I will not be surprised if we do see a rollback in the amount of benefits per person under the food stamp program. And that's because there were provisions that accelerated the payments that were put in the uh, Recovery Act program and that were authorized in the 2008 Farm Bill that Mr. Harkin played a role in. So there might be a rollback to what was allowed prior to that. But I don't think you're going to see significant cuts in the food and, the, and nutrition programs. And I'm not sure that it's in the best interest of farmers to be pitting themselves, as some people undoubtedly will, and I'm not saying I agree with this, but they will be saying that you, you know farmers are going to be taking money out of the mouths of babes will be the accusation that will be coming if you know there's not across the board reductions in farm program spending. So this is another chart that just looks at the debt commission and uh, really what is happening with our federal debt and whether or not we need to be able to bring that down. The lowest level in this chart shows how we would be bringing the debt as a percent of gross domestic prod, uh, product down if that deficit commission proposal that I mentioned cutting $10 billion and, and putting another five back into the SURE program, what that would look like. So obviously, it's an improvement. It doesn't get us all the way there, but it does show that we're going to be making some significant reductions. And I think that's the part that most people are, are looking at. They don't, I, I haven't heard anybody say that they think all farm programs or any program should go totally away, but can we consolidate? Can we look at things more creatively? And um, and if we do, what does that look like? Um, this is the overall um, outcome of the final commission report that I referenced with the $5 billion redirected to the SURE program. It also looked at reductions in direct payments and limits on conservation programs, which I think have been very, very popular, not only in Iowa, but across the nation. Conservation Stewardship Program, Environmental Quality Incentive Program, which is oversubscribed right now. There's so much demand for that, as well as reduced funding for the Market Access Program. I want to switch gears here just a little bit and talk about the political landscape that we're facing right now um, so you get a little better feel. And I have to sh share with you that this year, more than any other, I have heard from younger producers who are telling me that they want the government out of agriculture. It's almost rep reminiscent to some of the things I heard back in 95, 96, uh, as we were ramping up to, for the first time, a disconnect programmatic uh, federal farm programs from production. You know, there wasn't a requirement anymore that you had to plant a specific crop in order to get your payment, which was then called a transition payment, now a direct payment. But uh, at that time, and I had this great conversation with Senator Roberts about this last week because he was chairing the House Ag Committee at the time, um, he said, you know, remember when we did this, there was also an expectation that we would get the federal government out of over-regulating agriculture. We were going to address the state taxes. We were going to address uh, getting the EPA out of, uh, you know, overreach. And so there were some very common themes at that time. The other, other environment that was very similar to 95, 96 when we went through and developed Freedom to Farm is this chart, which shows that net farm income is rebounding. And I don't think it, you know, I have to make any surprise announcements to those of you who are, are farming. Commodity prices are up su substantially. And we've got... Uh, uh, you know, a terrific track record that we're building in terms of supporting the overall U.S. economy. The ag sector is one of the brightest sectors in the economy right now. So, um, you know, that's, that's a wonderful piece of news. But along with that, we know also comes increased volatility and increased production costs. We know farm line costs are going up. We know cash rents are going up. We know price of fuel is going up. So it points to a picture of really increased volatility. The good news is, 
flip to the next chart here, is that there's still relatively low debt. Now, I think these numbers are going to be stepping up a little bit as we you know, try to address these increased production costs. But for the most part, you can see that what happened from 8085 was a cruel lesson for a lot of us that were you know, involved in agriculture at that time. You remember the skyrocketing interest rates and how difficult it was for so many people to stay in farming. It was just a really tough time. But as a result of that, a lot of farmers learned their lesson. They paid down debt. And so the, the trend line here on debt to equity and debt to asset is very fair, favorable. And it's been around 12% since 2002. So farmers are very well positioned to withstand some of this volatility given that you know if commodity prices stay high. What I think you're going to continue to hear from the Ag Committee chairman is that we know prices don't always stay high. Um, there's all this volatility. What goes up must come down. So that's where I think you really have opportunities in this next farm bill, because you need to be thinking about not only what's happening right now, but what do you want in terms of federal support going forward? What types of things do you need to feed a growing, hungry, and very troubled world? that is supposed to reach 9 billion in population by 2050. What is it going to take to be able to do that and produce food and fuel and fiber for this country and do it in a sustainable fashion that preserves natural resources like our soil, like our water, and protects um, the environment? So with that kind of a background, I'm just laying out three things here that I think will be key as we look forward in the 2012 Farm Bill. Risk management, rural development, and research. On risk management, um, these are some of the different things that will be coming into play as we look at the 2012 Farm Bill. Direct payments have already been debated by many farm groups. Uh, Iowa Farm Bureau, as many of you have heard, already came out and say that they would be open to perhaps reinvesting the current level of about $5 billion a year of direct payments into other areas. Um, I know there was a lot of discussion during the annual American Soybean Association meeting. Um, most folks aren't laying their cards on the table quite yet and saying, yes, we want to give, give these up, but they're probably the most high profile and most frequently challenged part of the Farm Bill safety net right now. One of the good things about direct payments is that they are uh, disconnected from any kind of production requirement, uh, except for, of course, you, you know, your, your crop and your uh, conservation. Uh, but they are also WTO uh, compliant. They are considered green box, so they don't count against uh, what we would be able to provide in terms of support. And let's face it, what is provided for American farmers is still a lot less than what is provided around the globe, especially in the uh, European Union. But direct payments are just one of several programs that are out there in terms of uh, having the, the ACRE program was not well subscribed the last two years. It was very complex. Uh, can that be simplified? Would that be a better way of providing uh, support in terms of risk management. The SURE program, uh, we talked a little bit about that already. Is that the way that you'd like to go in terms of a standing disaster program? Certainly that will be the push from people like Budget Chairman Mr. Conrad. Ad hoc disaster payments were supposed to go away uh, as a result of having the standing disaster program, but you know whether you agree with it or not, uh, Blanche Lincoln, who was chairman of the Senate Ag Committee, was in political trouble. And uh, she decided she needed ad hoc disaster payments for growers in Arkansas and managed to talk the vice president, uh, Mr. Biden, into making those available and a directive to USDA to provide ad hoc disaster payments was carried out, not at the level that she had requested, but it was still one of those things that left kind of a bitter taste in a lot of people's mouths because you only had to have a very low threshold of only about 5% in order to claim payment. 
The cotton program is going to need to be changed because it's been successfully challenged in WTO by the Brazilians. Um, crop insurance. A lot of folks know that um, we're already given, and so the $6 billion that was cut came out of the crop insurance companies in terms of their agreement to deliver the program. I think you're going to see two other big challenges to the crop insurance program. One is going to look at uh, whether or not there are additional ways that we can deliver crop insurance. You've got folks at your FSA and the other USDA offices saying, golly, you know, we don't do as much as we did uh, in terms of farm programs, uh, so should we take over delivery of the crop insurance system? And folks like Mr. Babcock at Iowa State have been a very big advocate of that. You've got some folks on the House Ag Committee who think that we could be providing it more efficiently if the federal government delivered insurance as they did a few years ago. Others will be saying the private partner uh, delivery system works very efficiently. Uh, crop insurance agents certainly believe so. So uh, that will be one of the debates under crop insurance. The other will be looking at the premium subsidy provided to farmers and whether or not that should be trimmed back. So I think that there's a real likelihood that uh, crop insurance could still be uh, challenged in this next farm bill. Margin insurance is coming up from the livestock sector. The national dairy folks have uh, proposed a new margin insurance plan, which <clears throat> could carry over into other sectors of the livestock community. I think the pork producers have been talking to them about it. So those are some of the other things you'll be hearing about. What would this help people? The margin between their revenue and their production cost, certainly as their feed costs increase. And then last but not least, and I throw conservation into this whole risk management portfolio because I think a lot of people understand the importance of preserving soil and water quality as part of their ability to farm profitably. And if we don't have good programs that support uh, the ability to put conservation practices on the land, will farmers have the ability to continue to produce at the level that we're going to need to in feeding 9 billion hungry people. So be on the lookout for the EQIP program, the Conservation Stewardship Program. There will be a lot of discussion about whether those can be streamlined, whether they could be consolidated. And I think there's pretty general agreement that we could make the portfolio of programs under conservation a little easier for producers to get into and to access. So those are kind of some of the main areas of debate you're going to see surfacing. Uh, secondly, my second of the three R's is research. There was a huge debate over this last week in appropriations. As we talk about getting rid of earmarks, don't be surprised that some of the programs that have been very key in the state of Iowa may be challenged because uh, you won't have that ability for somebody to selectively say that it has to go to Iowa State, for example. Now, having said that, Mr. Latham, who sits in a very key position on the House Appropriations Committee, I think will we'll do a wonderful job trying to make sure that Iowa interests are provided for. But you saw other people like Mr. Kingston, the, uh, the subcommittee chairman for agricultural appropriations, challenging the land grant system last week, saying the, he used the word corporate welfare more than I've ever heard in a, in a subcommittee hearing, talking about whether or not we should really be investing in public research when he believes, apparently, that we can have more done by the private companies. So this will be another key part of the debate. I think that we made a very big move in the right direction to create the National Institute of Food and Agriculture. It basically tees up investments in agricultural research at the same kind of level as we would have in the National Institute of Science and, and uh, really establishes a platform to have competitive uh, bidding on uh, the kinds of research that we need going forward. And so to the extent that we can continue to have funds flowing through that, we can have a very robust public sector research platform. Uh, if you agree with Mr. Kingston and you think that we should be doing more of it through the private sector, then that's not an issue for you. But in discussions that I've had with farm groups around the country, 
research continues to come up as one of the key areas that farmers would like to see investment in. So I, if, if you would agree with that, I would certainly make your voices known on how you can use uh, investments in public sector research to make your farming more profitable in the future. The last area, and then I'll, hopefully we'll have a little time for questions here. I know we got a little bit of a, a late start, but uh, um, it's just on the area of rural development. The fact that you are able to be in remote locations as I am and we're all on this webinar, I think it's just so exciting. Nobody had to jump in the car and uh, nobody had to uh, fly in a plane to, to go do this presentation because we've got access to broadband. We've got infrastructure out there that enables us to be very profitable in farm country. It's the envy of the world. The Brazilians would uh, you know, relish the kinds of infrastructure that we have in this country. So should we be thinking about how we do more? Should we be thinking about what uh, we can do to invest a nickel and uh, get a dollar uh, turnaround in your loan guarantees? Uh, this administration has been doing more grants than guarantees, but the options are there under rural development programs to do everything from uh, making investments in critical care emergency centers to hospitals to daycares to doing value-added producer grants, which have helped people like my family uh, start a winery. Uh, it's really a diverse set of programs that uh, can be helpful to people in rural America. And as we look at the fact, and not to say that anyone is old on the line, uh, but you look at the overall population and agriculture and the age of farmers in this country, uh, how are we going to bring the next generation home? And I think part of that is looking at how we make our rural communities robust enough that they want to come home and that they have a place for their spouses to work and a school for their kids to attend and uh, facilities, amenities that they want to participate in. So uh, as we look again towards the longer term outcome of the 2012 Farm Bill, I think that uh, there are some real good opportunities in rural development that uh, can enable us to really make some wise long term investments. Uh, I'm going to end here with, um, this is uh, my photo overlooking uh, my husband and I have a farm in North Dakota as well as uh, being active in our farm in Iowa. but. Uh, this is just one aspect of rural development that I think is very important to remember. If you've got to, uh, connectivity, there's a lot of things you can do in terms of selling your soybeans uh, all around the globe, uh, getting access to information, and uh, really being uh, you know, at the top of your game in terms of business people. So uh, with that, what I'd like to close by saying is that the timeline for the 2012 Farm Bill is really ramping up. It will be very much guided by what we see happening on the budget front. And that will pretty much determine what we're going to have in terms of resources to work for. And I can almost guarantee that it won't be any more money than we currently have in this current farm bill. And it's likely to be less. There, you're going to see hearings starting this summer. And then you're going to see what's called an audit on the House Agricultural Committee side looking at every single aspect of farm programs and how we're spending our money. There are some folks who think that we might start writing by the end of this year. Uh, I think that that's a little premature. Uh, but again, if we have a budget number that kind of caps things down, maybe we can go ahead late in 2011. But I know Mr. Lucas on the House side wants to wait till 2012 and see if the budget picks.